In 1983, NASA sent Sally Ride into space as the first American woman to ever enter into orbit. In, her, in the lead up to her launch, the engineering team at NASA was very hard at work to ensure that everything would go off without a hitch. So at some point before the big day, the all-male team came to Ride uh, to ask her if a sufficient number of tampons for a week-long mission was 100, 100 tampons. Uh, Ride simply responded, no, that would not be the correct number. Uh, when pressed for more information, she told them that they could cut that number in half and it would still be way too many. Um, <laughs> I love this story for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them is that I just find it fun to imagine what led up to the moment where they finally like landed on the number 100. Like, were they all sitting around a round table? Like, how long were they talking? These are engineers. Did they do like research on the absorbency per tampon and do like back of the envelope calculations? Um, and another reason I love this story is I think it's really um, well suited to communicate this idea that even the most well-intentioned group of people uh, will often do a laughable job of trying to meet the needs of another group that they are not part of. I think about how much smoother that process would have gone if there was just one menstruating person on that engineering team. This really drives home for me the idea that to truly make something that meets someone's needs, someone who has those needs themselves, must be part of the development process. And as you may have guessed from the title of my talk, I'm not here to talk about tampons. Um, so in recent years, there's been a growing uh, awareness, understanding, and acceptance of the importance of technology accessibility. Um, and as we all know, technology doesn't just create itself. Um, data doesn't analyze itself, or you know, at least not yet. Um, so we have this process of an initial developer, contributor, maintainer um, who supports the creation of a tool or who is doing the data science themselves. Uh, so they then produce an output, whether that's an app or a dashboard, a piece of software, um, and then that subsequently ends in the hands of a stakeholder or end user. And in most of this dialogue so far, we tend to focus at the end on that end user. Uh, and we generally do this by focusing in on the output stage. We do this by asking ourselves questions like, can someone who is colorblind distinguish the features of this graph? Or have I included sufficient alt text for someone who requires non-visual access to this information? But I'm here to insist that this is the wrong place for us to be focusing if our goal is to avoid being like that all-male engineering team at NASA. Instead, of focusing primarily on the experience of the end user, we need to look further upstream and divert our attention toward the experience of the programmer or data scientist. We need to work to reduce unnecessary barriers for disabled coders and continue to support uh, their ability to continue to use um, and contribute to open source projects. And so to do this, we need to think about the tools, packages, languages, programs, et cetera, the data scientists and developers depend on in their daily work. We need to figure out how we can improve the accessibility of these tools so that we can ensure fewer structural barriers to the continued participation and flourishing of disabled members of the open source community. In the remainder of my talk, I'm going to discuss some simple steps that can be taken to begin improving the accessibility of, of open source projects. Importantly, these are steps that can be taken by absolutely anyone and don't require have any, having any depth of knowledge in accessibility or web accessibility. As a result of that, I'm not going to get into any of the particularly technical aspects of technology accessibility. Um, in the link to my slides, which I'll bring up again at the end, um, I also have a collection of resources that I am also continuing to add to. So if you come back in the following weeks, there's gonna be more and more resources. So imagine that you are renovating your kitchen and everything's going perfectly until you come across some issue. So you do some Googling, you try to figure out what's going on, and eventually you think you figured it out and it seems like you can solve it yourself if you just get your hands on a specific power tool. So you go online and spend some significant effort researching and selecting the right tool, making sure it has a specific set of features and capabilities that you need. You order it and unfortunately, once it arrives, it has plug type F, which is used commonly throughout much of Europe, but you're located in the US and therefore your outlets only accommodate type A or B plugs. You, it would have been great if this information was included in the product description, but it wasn't. Uh, in fact, it's not present in the description of almost any tool that you can find online. So your best bet is to just keep buying new ones and trying them to see if they work. 
If you're thinking that this sounds like it would be an incredibly frustrating way to get something done, you're right. Um, and it's also the reality for many disabled data scientists and programmers when it comes to trying out open source tools in order to solve their programming problems. In this metaphor, we should be thinking of the power tool as a package or IDE or tool, um, and the plug outlet compatibility is, is accessibility, right? So it's, it's, somebody, it's the IDE that someone wants to work in, and the outlet is their screen reader. And if you don't, in a lot of instances, they have no way of knowing whether or not the two will work together until after they've downloaded it and tried it. Um, and unlike an incompatible plug, you can't just like go on Amazon and buy a travel adapter and just circumvent the whole thing with accessibility. So this brings me to the first thing we can do, which is create accessibility docs. What I say when I, what I mean when I say this is creating documentation that helps individuals quickly assess whether something meets not only their technical requirements, but crucially also their accessibility requirements. Um, this can look like a lot of different things, like just a high level status of the accessibility of the tool. Um, importantly, you can just say that you don't know. Uh, even it is unknown how compatible this is with screen readers or we haven't done any research into the accessibility of this is significantly more informative than saying nothing at all. Um, you can also create start curating a list of known accessibility problems. And you can highlight accessibility features. Some of these might be things that are specific to accessibility, but there are probably some that already exist, like keyboard shortcuts or various options for error handling. So once you establish what you do already know or not know about accessibility, you're gonna wanna set up a way to get further information. So you're gonna create a form for feedback. Um, one of the easiest ways to do this is to create an accessibility issue template or label. Um, and this serves a variety of purposes. One is it serves a really valuable signal. Under status quo, um, when already facing a lot of other barriers for their participation, a disabled programmer has to then try to assess whether or not it's actually worth it to put the time and effort to create a valuable reproducible example because it's not clear whether or not the maintainers of that project actually care and want to fix this. I would hope that everybody that's in this room is in the group of people that would want to, but there is still a lot of ableism within tech, and there are a lot of people who think it's really just not that important to focus on. So this gets you information because now people know, okay, it's worth it to try to put in you know, this information. Um, it also elevates the importance of accessibility and helps us with culture change so we can start thinking of problems with accessibility as bugs and not as add-on features that we think of after the initial development of the product is complete. And it's crucial for identifying issues that are specific to the particular tool. Some issues with accessibility are going to come up again and again and again, um, but some are just gonna be really niche and you're not gonna know um, unless you're told about your specific project. Now, if you're thinking that these examples are like cool, but they're mostly just setting the stage for improving accessibility and you want to start doing something to actually improve things, or maybe you're not a maintainer of a project and you want to be a contributor, but you don't really feel like you have as much leeway to do some of these earlier steps, um, then uh, I suggest that you work on improving technical documentation. And okay, I know writing documentation isn't exactly most people's favorite parts of the job, um, you know, maybe there'd be fewer people in the room if I had highlighted that this talk was mostly going to be about documentation uh, <laughs> in the abstract. Um, but I'm hoping that we can manufacture some excitement by um, displaying just how huge of a barrier poorly accessible documentation can be. So let's say you're trying to get an overview of some sort of complex process in order to better understand something you're building or trying to debug. So you bring up documentation for, say, conce the conceptual architecture of this tool. Uh, I've done that for an actual technical documentation page. Um, and I'd like for us to take a moment to hear what the experience would be like with a screen reader. Uh, it's an important note that um, the captions here are mine, which I added for accessibility for everyone in the room. This wouldn't actually be part of the screen reader experience. Oh, I forgot to turn mute off. One second. Um, I have to pull out of that because It's not, let's see, plugged in. We tested beforehand. Main landmark, the following okay. diagram shows the relationship. Cool, sorry, let me get back in there. Link found an error, Report. link download, the manual, link found an error. Main landmark, the following diagram shows the relationships. 
Link graphic OpenStack conceptual architecture. So, hmm. You might think if this is all the information you have, maybe this documentation is still under construction. I mean, all it really said is that, you know, this is a representation and it's a graphic of conceptual architecture. You don't know if it's an icon or a logo or something actually important. Now, I'm cited, so I can go see what the page actually looks like. And for those of us in the room and online who are cited, let's take a visual look at what the page looks like. Link found an error. Well, well. Okay, so that's a lot of information that wasn't included in the screen reader experience. Uh, there is a giant diagram on the screen that is incredibly complex and would probably take me a few minutes to digest visually. Um, and the alt text for that is just graphic of OpenStack architecture, which is obviously pretty insufficient. So this brings me to the first thing we can do, which is to improve alt text. Um, and I'd like to correct a fundamental misunderstanding many people have about the purpose of alt text. If you're able to remember just this, you're already on your way to writing much more accessible text. Um, and it's that alt text's purpose is to serve the function of the image in place of the image. It's not to describe an image. Uh, so a really good test without becoming proficient in screen reader use is to use the plain text version of your documentation. Don't render your markdown. Use just that. Are you able to get the information out of it that you need? If not, your alt text is insufficient and you need to go back and try again. Um, we should also be working on making sure that any hyperlinked text is informative. Uh, so frequently you might see something like, to learn more about a really cool package, click here. Where click here is the link. Um, many people who use screen readers will cycle through all the links on a page to find the external resource they need, which means they encounter it without the um, rest of the sentence, um, yeah, the context of the rest of the sentence. So they would actually encounter something like this. Click here or here which obviously doesn't provide sufficient information. And so you would want, what you would want is something more like, learn more about a really cool package where that is the linked text. You should also be using a consistent logical heading structure. Um, you're gonna wanna use actual heading elements and not just stylizing the text. Um, and make sure you don't skip level, levels of heading hierarchy. If you want something to not be as big as the you know, level two heading, um, then you should be using CSS to change the visual appearance rather than just skipping down to an H3 or an H4. Um, this is because people using screen readers can't visually scan and skim the page the way that I can using my eyes. Um, and so if they don't have headings to give them an idea of where they are on the page and decide whether they want to go into that section, their option is to just listen to the entire documentation being read out verbatim um, from top to bottom, which is pretty terrible. Um, this also provides really important cognitive scaffolding for even sighted developers, especially for individuals who might be recovering from a head injury, who are neurodivergent, who are experiencing brain fog as a result of chronic fatigue, or maybe you just got really terrible sleep last night and it's helpful to have documentation that doesn't suck. You should also be using clear and concise language, um, breaking up walls of text where you can, writing in short sentences, writing in the positive form, using active voice. These are all things we're probably somewhat familiar with. So to sort of summarize our points, there are a few things that we can do to start improving the accessibility of open source projects. One, we can create accessibility documentation, um, and this will allow people to better assess whether um, something meets their technical and accessibility requirements. We can create a forum for feedback um, using GitHub issue templates or something similar, and we can improve our te technical documentation. So with the last bit of time that we have, I'd like to invite everyone in the room to take a moment and think, what's a small, specific action you can take in the next 24 to 48 hours to go and start improving this in a project that you really care about? Keep in mind, you don't necessarily need to be a core maintainer. Many projects have clear instructions for how to suggest a change to documentation. In fact, the first open source pull request that I have ever opened was um, one to improve some of the alt text in Jupyter Notebooks documentation. This is also a really good way if you are a core maintainer of a project and you're trying to get more involvement from the community, um, a lot of these fixes are really wonderful, good first issues. Um, and so you can kind of um, tackle it from both ends. So a few ideas um, I'll just sort of pull up on the slide. Um, and 
with issues, you can make it for something specific that you'd like to fix or just for auditing. So maybe just make an issue for yourself to look at the alt text if you don't know right away if any of it's good or not. Um, and I would suggest that you set a reminder for yourself to make sure you do this. Put it in your phone, add something to your calendar to do it tomorrow while you're, or later tonight while you're waiting for your flight. Um, and I assure you, you're not gonna wanna forget to do this. And that's because uh, as an extra piece of motivation, I have designed a custom hex sticker associated with my talk. Uh, but the only way to get one is to tag me in the comments of a pull request or an issue or email me a screenshot, something like that. So I have a limited number of them. Uh, if you're here in person, you can try to come find me once you're done to get your sticker. Um, I also know the conference ends in a few hours and there's a lot of people watching online. Uh, so if you, don't, if you can't find me in person, I'll make my best effort to coordinate mailing these out to as many people as I can until I run out. Uh, so thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to getting to see the first steps you all take to starting to commit to change. Thank you so much, Rose. I'll also say, if you want to do a dplyr or tidyr technical documentation improvement, I will happily merge that. <laughs> then you can get your sticker. Um, we have one question in the Slido. Uh, what would you recommend to incorporate into visualization packages to make them more accessible? And maybe is there anything beyond just alt text? Yeah. Um, so one thing, um, uh, another thing that I didn't touch on is accessibility for people who are colorblind. So one thing that could be really great um, for visualization packages is to change default color settings so that they are, you want to make accessibility the easy thing to do, not the hard thing to do. So everywhere we should be making it, you know, easy, um, yeah, easy to make sure, you know, if you're not thinking about it, you shouldn't have to think about it. Um, there, uh, there should also be easy ways to add, like, figure text, which is true of, of most. Um, and on my external resources, um, I'll be adding some more resources about how to actually write good alt text for visualizations, because uh, that's a tricky skill to master. Do you, Hadley, do you remember what Mine uses to like, like it like overlays over the image to make sure that it's like colorblind friendly? Do you remember what that thing is called? Oh, there's some cool technology. There's some cool technology to make sure that your pictures are colorblind friendly out there. The, like overlay on top of the images yeah. themselves. I, cool. I don't know much about like colorblind related, but since you mentioned overlays, one thing I will mention is, because um, I think everybody in the disability community would be mad if I didn't, um, is that if you're creating a website or something like that where you're gonna host your documentation, anything like that, um, if you see a product, there's ones called like Accessibi or things like that that are overlays that say they'll fix your documentation, or I'm sorry, fix your web accessibility. Uh, you shouldn't use them. They're under a lot of lawsuits right now because they actually make accessibility worse for a lot of people. Um, so they, people have developed plugins to disable them because uh, using them actually makes websites more inaccessible. So if it sounds too good to be true, like a quick fix like that, it probably is. Are there any um, existing, like any kind of templates that you can use for creating good accessible documentation that you know of? Um, Yes, so I have, in, in the external resources I have, there are uh, a couple different um, style guides, um, examples, and yeah, things of that nature. Great. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you.